Well, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, your time today uh, for this Seven Keys to a Winning Team webinar. Uh, I'm still waiting for a few people to log in, but um, we will get underway. And um, so let's get started. So welcome and thank you for investing your time to join this training webinar this afternoon. The fact that you are here shows you are serious about leadership in business. This is in an informal and interactive presentation, so let's have some fun together. My name is Phil Bajura, and I'm honoured and feel very privileged to have gained significant business knowledge throughout my 30 plus years uh, in senior management and within the corporate food industry. And in the last 14 years of being in business for myself. During that time, I've been responsible for implementing significant cultural change in many different and varied business environments. And I look forward to sharing some of this experience with you today. We do have a lot to cover, so take as many notes as you need. And if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. If you haven't already, please open your chat box down. Okay, so a little bit about learning and this is what I call the point of power. So we all know people that lie in their bed and all they want to do is lay blame, make excuses, even worse, live in denial. By the same token, we also know uh, people that take their oar and they steer their ship in the business in the direction that they want to take it by being responsible, accountable, and taking ownership. So those people that are below that point of power, they're actually in a powerless situation. And then the people who are above that point of power are in a more powerful uh, position uh, to take control of their own uh, direction. So above the point of power is about the what, the when, and the how. And then below that point of power is about who, why, and uh, really, once you get in that denial position is withdrawing, and that's not a good place to be. So below the point of power is all about reasons, and above the point of power is about results. So what's important to note here is that it is possible for us as individuals, as business owners, as managers, as leaders within our business, that sometimes we will fall below that point of power. What's important is to recognize when you have done that, and then to find a way that's going to get you back above the point of power. So for some people, it might be uh, going and having a, a coffee with a friend. It might be just picking up the phone and talking to someone. Uh, for myself, uh, in when I work in large factories, if somebody ticked me off, uh, what I would do is, um, just excuse me, uh, admit, um, is to take a walk around the factory. That allowed me the time to gather my thoughts and work out a solution to how I was going to then approach that issue. So a little bit about learning. Anyone with teenage kids, they're all experts at this. Yeah, I know, mum, dad. Uh, when they get older, they do it a little bit more politely and they, you can't see me, but they cross their arms and say, yeah, I know. But this approach kills the possibility that maybe you can learn something from this conversation. So, can we get agreement that everyone will treat today as a totally new experience? And let's eliminate I know from our vocabulary and replace it with isn't that interesting? 
when we replace I know with isn't that interesting, it opens our minds to the possibility that there may be other ways of thinking about things. So what I want out of training today, uh, we're going to take our first poll. So um, if you could, uh, uh, I'm just launching the poll now. So if you could just um, pick out what's the key thing that you would like to achieve out of today's session? So if you could just uh, click on that now and um, we'll wait for you to complete that before we move on. Okay, so a few people still uh, to register. Okay, it's starting to come through now. All right, okay, so um, the, the results coming through uh, indicating uh, that um, building a championship team is uh, the most common one. Okay, so moving on. The acronym for team. So the acronym for team is totally committed and together every employee will achieve both your company goals and their own goals as they do much more than what you've been instructed so your comfort zone seminars don't work the people that come to them do i can start you and educate you and train you but you as an individual or as a team still have to make this happen once you go back to your work environment. So my job today is to inspire you with ideas that will challenge how you will engage with your team going forward and to push your boundaries on what you believe is possible and what you believe you can achieve. In some ways, it may make you feel uncomfortable, even take you outside your own comfort zone. This will be key to engaging and building a truly championship team in your organization. So if we consider the current state of play in the world, no one would argue that there may be a problem or three. These problems started somewhere back in time and were not properly addressed when they were identified. It is the same in leadership and business. If you don't nip problems in the bud, they will have a tendency to gather momentum and increase in size. They will come back to bite you if you don't attend to them promptly. The longer you ignore it, the harder it will be to address and resolve. When you ignore any issues you identify, they just get bigger and bigger. Using the analogy of the roadway of life, imagine you are a jogger. As you're running along the roadway, you feel some chest pains. These are the signs that something is not quite right. When you ignore this, it is like getting hit by a lump of 4B2. And if we ignore that, ultimately, it will end in uh, being run over by a Mack truck. My own example of this was at an Action Coach conference in Bali a number of years ago. We played beach volleyball early every morning. One morning I was playing and made a dive for the ball and felt a twang in my hamstring. Stupidly, I ignored this twang and kept playing thinking I'm invincible. Less than two minutes later, I took another dive and this time the twang was audible to everyone around me. Luckily, I stopped after being hit by the 4B2 and I stopped. Needless to say, the rest of the conference and the plane road ride home was extremely painful. On diagnosis back home, I completely torn the hamstring from the bone 
and end up with a fully bru or fully bruised from my hip to my ankle. The most important thing with strong leadership is that when you do identify an issue, you must stop, address it immediately, nip it in the bud before it becomes a huge problem. One of my early lessons in management was that I had allowed one of my subordinates to carry on with poor attitude and behaviour whenever I communicated with him. At that time, my belief was that as one of my best operators, I could not afford to lose him, despite the fact that he lacked respect for management and also the rest of the team. After a period, I made a decision that this type of poor attitude and behaviour was going to be unacceptable going forward. To cut a long story short, I took the individual through the counselling procedure and he resigned after the first uh, formal warning. The interesting thing that followed was I had other team members come up and thank me for dealing with the bad behaviour of that individual. What I was unaware of was that he was also impacting other team members with his bad attitude and behaviour and ultimately impacting on their own performance due to them walking on eggshells around him. The other thing I learned that whilst he was a great operator, he was also replaceable. In fact, the person that took over the role ended up being far better in the operation of the equipment and also in the communication and coming up with ideas on how we could further improve on efficiency and productivity. The key learning that I took away from this early career experience was that I had to set the bar high in what I would or would not tolerate in terms of attitude and behaviour from my subordinates under my leadership. The key to this was how I was going to communicate with my team. There are three cool, uh, tools to communication that you need to understand. So please write these down. The words that you use only represent 7% of your communication with your audience. Your voice and more importantly your intonation represent 38% of how you communicate. For example, if you yell and scream at your team continuously, your impact for getting things done might work immediately, but over the long term, the respect you get from the team will be negative versus if you communicate with respect and engage openly with your team. Your own body language represents 55% of how you communicate and how well you communicate. When you are inspired yourself and show genuine interest with whom you are communicating, the response and willingness to contribute uh, to contribute you receive back will be far more engaging for all parties, as opposed to the body language you will exhibit if your mind is occupied on something else rather than the task at hand. So, as a leader in your business or management team, it is important that you understand the disc profile styles that you and your team members have. In understanding disc, you will learn that not everyone thinks, acts, or behaves the way that you do. My biggest learning about DISC that I finally started to understand was that whilst I may have been at odds with peers or team members on how to approach a project, a problem, or an issue, ultimately we were all aiming to achieve the same end goal. We just had different ways of thinking about how we would achieve the solution. When you learn this and tap into the, the knowledge that you have gained through understanding DISC, you can start to utilise the different styles of your team members to the advantage of your team and then also the outcomes that you are trying to achieve. Understanding the four different styles. It is important to note that 
all will have that we all have some of each style in our own personalities although we are usually more dominant in one or two of each style so the first style we start with is e which is discipline or dominance and the attributes that uh well, well actually we'll move on and and look at uh the next one is influence the third one is uh, steadiness and the fourth one is compliance now the key attributes of a dominant person is that they're very results orientated they're direct and they're also very competitive a high i person is someone that shows extreme enthusiasm they're friendly and they're very optimistic they're also quite uh indirect the steadiness is uh, shows sincerity. They are patient. They're modest. They also uh, like things to be in control. And then the fourth area is compliance. So they're accurate. They need um, cautious and also very contemplative they also need lots of data to analyze um, and are actually quite slow decision makers so d's and i's are quite outgoing c's and s's are more reserved d's and c's are task orientated and i's and s's are people orientated We will also change our styles depending on the amount of stress and pressure that we are under and also in situational circumstances and what we may be experiencing in the moment. So for example, if we're in a, if, if we may be a high I or a high S style, if we're in a conflict situation, quite often our D will raise up above its normal levels and we can become quite dominant. Later on, I'll be giving you an opportunity on how you can access the DISC assessment tool to learn more about yourself, your team members, and also your customers. When you can understand them all better, you will have much better outcomes. Okay, I'm going to run a poll. And so the question is, um sorry just uh okay um i just need to get out of that one sorry i'm just technology is challenging me right at the moment just bear with me Okay, so the, the question in the poll uh, it should be open now is, are you currently utilizing DISC assessments in your workplace? Uh, please take that poll now. Okay, so um, we have 75% um, are not ut utilizing um, disk assessments at the present time. All right, so the winning teams know how to get the right people on the bus. When you develop a winning team and engage them with their roles within the business, they know how to not only get the right people on, on your bus, but also how to keep them on the bus. One of the keys to achieving this is to ensure that you have a robust recruitment process in place and that you include and involve key members of the team as part of that recruitment process. So let's have a look. The key steps 
is to, first of all, identify, uh, identify the positions you want to recruit for. Create the position description or position contract outline and outline what the key tasks for the role include and how you will measure accountability and performance in the execution of the role. Step three is to create the person profile. What the ideal person's skills, abilities, and personal traits are required for that position. Utilize the DISC word descriptors to help you identify the right traits required for that position. Step four is create the job, uh, the job ad around the PD or position description and person profile. So include the good and bad things about the job and also something that is attractive about the local area and the lifestyle change it presents, particularly if you want to attract new talent to your area. Step five is then advertise the job on Seek and or Indeed. Advertise on your Facebook business page, LinkedIn and Instagram and advertise internally on your notice board. Um, it's important that you allow other team members the opportunity to apply for the position. Call me if you need help with this. Please note that today paper ads are a waste of time and money. Okay, so um, step six then becomes shortlist the applicants that you're going to interview, prepare a list of six to eight key questions you would like the candidates to respond to. Dig deep for every answer, use question softeners like, that's interesting, tell me more about that. Step seven then is conduct the interviews, ideally in a group interview if possible. Identify the candidates that stand out from the rest. Be careful to look for great attitude before skills and experience. Step eight then is shortlist one to three candidates for a final interview. Have the shortlisted candidates complete the DISC and Motivators Assessment. Remember that the assessment process will increase the probability of selecting the right candidate up to 88% versus 63% for only conducting interviews and reference checking. So personality profiling uh, will account for an additional 15% uh, probability of selecting that right candidate. Conduct the final round of interviews individually, using the DISC report to seek clarification on things that you would like to explore deeper about their own uh, beliefs, values and uh, attributes. Conduct another inter interview if necessary. So if you're still not 100% sure, keep uh, asking the candidate to come in and have further discussions. Conduct reference checking with the nominated referees. Ask for referees in the final in the interview if they have not already uh, been provided to you. Then you can make a job offer. Create the employment contract with all of the relevant details as agreed with the candidate in and post the final interview. And the final step then is to start the new employee with an induction plan in place. Here it is important to adopt the hire slow and fire fast policy when you, um, when you have a mismatch. So the first key to a winning team is strong leadership. As a leader, you must have passion, focus, 
and take responsibility for the leadership of your organization or your role within the organization. Your team will be looking up to you to provide the strategies and direction for the business or department. Without passion, focus and responsibility, you will not be able to engage the team or achieve the traits that champion te uh, championship teams exhibit. So as the leader, you must have passion. Sorry, we'll move on. Uh, you must understand the importance of true communication and the impact of how you communicate with your superiors, your peers, and your subordinates. Let me give you an example. I worked in PNG for about 18 months. And one day I was down the back talking with one of my colleagues. And um, whilst we were having a chat about how we were going to improve the situation and position for the PNG people, uh, one of the nationals uh, was walking by and Tom uh, called him over and he said, um, hey, Bucky, have you got a moment? Could you do me a favour, please? See that load of, of that pile of rubbish over in the corner there? Can you grab the ute, put the rubbish in the back, and then take it down the back and burn it? So Tom and I, uh, Bucky did that, and we, we saw him drive away. When he, um, uh, so Tom and I were continued to talk for a while, and after about 20 minutes, Tom said, I wonder where Bucky is, he should be back by now. About another 10 minutes later, we actually saw him walking up the road. When he finally got to us, Tom said to him, Bucky, where's the ute? And Bucky replied, but boss, you told me to take it down the back and burn it, and I did. So um, be aware of how your audience is reacting and responding to your communication. As true communication, is the response you get regardless of your intent. Always, always ask your audience to repeat back to you what they have understood about what you may have requested of them. Remember, you're learning about the different disc styles and how different people will apply their own interpretations on what they actually hear you say and what you have intended. In most companies, the owner tries to run all three and thus you can't get it all done. We're going to change that here today. So in the ideal cycle of business, the owner supports the team by setting the strategies, giving direction, giving leadership, paying the bills, staying profitable, paying the wages and giving encouragement and building systems and so on. The team supports the customer with great sales skills and great service. Through providing great products or services supported with high quality and outstanding consistency. Customers support the business by coming back more often, spending more on each visit and then telling their friends about your business. And in turn, the business then supports the owner through profits and over time, ultimately, ultimately being able to work less hours. You as the leader are the mentor and your job is to educate and ask the right questions. You will be contributing something at every ladder, uh, level of this ladder. How well you do this, Will, you will be contributing, some, uh, how well you do this will come back to your own style of communicating, teaching and sharing your knowledge. Your own beliefs and dreams and what you are aspiring to achieve in the business will impact on the quality of the questions you ask, the decisions and action that you take and that will directly affect the quality of the results that you then achieve. The results your team achieves will come down to how well you have been engaged and communicated with them 
at each level on the ladder. The second key to a winning team is having a common goal. So are you clear about where you are going and how you're going to get there? Have you set long-term goals for the business? And are they aligned with clear vision, mission and purpose statements that every team member can be truly engaged with? Is the vision, mission and purpose of the business aligned with each team member, uh, team member's own personal beliefs and their own values? Through my, throughout my career, I've had a number of instances where there has been a change in the management or ownership of the company I was working for, and the mandate for the business had changed that did not align with my own values and beliefs. When I identified that this had occurred, I immediately took action to start looking for a new position. I suspect that I was an exception rather than the rule. So my challenge for you is to establish that every one of your team members is truly aligned with your vision and mission for the business. If they are not, how will you address this? Your role as a strong leader of the team is to enroll and engage your team, team members through the vision you have for your business or department, and ensure that you have documented that vision with key goals that your team is striving to achieve for the, uh, the business or that department. Okay, um, so welcome back. Um, all right, so team one, what, uh, who, who's going to uh, communicate some of the ideas that you came up with? Team one was uh, Brian and Steve and James. All right, basically, um, um, Steve and I were just saying that it was about uh, keeping that communication door open, um, asking them to come in and just without, you know, observation with other, other workmates or whatever, just give them the chance to speak freely without any any um, consequences for doing so, just to be honest, so that we can help them. And yep, fantastic. I help. Yep. A anything else, Brian? Not unless Steve's got so. No, we just talked about it, you know, that, that you do have the, the reactive um, events that you, you deal with, but also um, Brian talked about having in his workplace like an open and ongoing sort of communication that he has with a lot of his staff. They, you know, they're comfortable to come to him with um, new ideas and to try things and, and occasionally fail, and that's okay. So, um, yep. yeah, that, that I guess that ongoing conversation as well as to try really, and keep people really engaged. Really important. Yep. We, try to, we try to really um, encourage fresh ideas and um, to really they've got anything on their mind or anything that they think may make everything uh, work easier, bring it forward, even if yep. it's the design of the equipment. Yeah, so, so important to, you know, give them the opportunity to contribute as well. So well done, team. Um, team two, Kate and Aaron, who, who'd like to uh, share some of your thoughts? Uh, yeah, so we just spoke about, uh, Kate and myself spoke about the understanding the person first to better understand how to respond to a scenario. Mm -hmm. So whether it's working through the DISC um, uh, system and then using that ladder, that quality of life ladder to understand where maybe spots of uh, things have been missed or items have been missed that you can, yeah, get that conversation flowing. And then uh, as you guys, Brian and Steve were saying before, um, let the staff member contribute in their own way that they want to and they feel wanted and needed again. Yep, yep, perfect. Anything else you want to add there, Cade? Yeah, I'll start off saying sorry, Aaron, I couldn't get myself off mute, mate, chuck in the deep end then. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, it's very, very much about keeping that um, 
the the door open. I mean, you've got to you've got to establish an environment where the employee can feel trust in you, and that you're not going to judge them or ridicule or just simply knock their idea down. So you, you keep that open, honest area, and then and that also helps with you knowing whether they're whether they're the reason that they're disengaged is a valid one or not. So you can you, you're just keeping your mind open. So oh, he, he does have a point there, and then. Once again, just lets you. The, the main thing is once you finish, just to reassure the employee that you that you value what they've what their opinion is and what they've got to say, yeah. to try and have a resolution at the end of the meeting. Uh, a key attribute of strong leadership. So, all very very valid points. Well done for uh, and thank you for your uh, contribution. All Do right. Say something. Sure. Um, just an observation that I've had. And it's it's been from my early days when in my twenties through to other places that I've worked through. In probably two to three times out of ten situations, people that are unhappy at work, it's not about money, it's not about their wages, it's really just about how they're accepted, whether they're heard and whether appreciated as a person or, or an identity, their own identity. You know, um, every guy generally has his own pride and. Um, wants to be of self-worth and if he feels like he's thought of as an idiot or he's unheard of, well then that's when he gets really dissatisfied and what have you. Yeah, so um, that's a great point you make there, Brian, and that's going to come up as point number six when we get to it. So, all right, um, again, thank you for your contributions. So the third uh, key to a winning team is the rules of the game. And the rules of the game relate to the culture that you are aiming to develop in your workplace for your business. So your documented policies and procedures manual will form the basis of the culture that you are determining that your business will run by. So think about a sport and the rules of the game. So on the playing field, the team understands and knows what each individual is responsible for in winning the game. Each team member is empowered to make their own decisions in how they play the game whilst the ball is in play. They also understand that when the ball goes outside the boundary or someone breaks a rule on the field, that they are no longer in control of making their own decisions and look to the umpire for making the final decision. It is no different in business. So when you have clearly articulated the rules of the game in business through your policies and procedures, your communication, your strong leadership and common goals, you will have a tight culture where everyone plays by the rules and in the context of winning the game of business. When you have unclear rules of the game, you end up with a loose culture, team members doing their, their own thing and only focusing on the content uh, of what they can bring to the table. In other words, they are not playing or contributing to the team. Okay, so another indicator for having a loose culture is when team members are not being held accountable for, the, for their actions, their attitude or behaviour. That is, team members not playing by your rules of the game. Earlier, we spoke about the roadway of life and the importance of dealing with issues when you identify them. So just remember, you get what you tolerate. Be sure to address each issue when the rules of the game are being broken uh, by team members. In identifying what you will and what you won't tolerate as part of the rules of the game, you must have a plan for when the rules have been broken or the ball goes out of bounds and demonstrated by poor attitude or behaviour by any of your team members. Having a documented counselling for imp improving employee performance procedure is critical here. The inference here in the approach to breaches of the rules of the game 
is having the mindset of improving performance, not sacking the employee because they may have done something wrong. My experience has been that by following the counselling procedure, 75% of the time, the employees has not realised that they've done something that may have ticked you off. With correct counselling, generally the employee sees the errors of their ways and improves their performance. It's a win-win situation. Um, Steve, I think you mentioned um, that you had an example where a poor performing employee in another department was um, dumped in your lap and the way that you overcame it, came it was in communication communicating and understanding that he, he wasn't aware that he was actually ticking people off. And uh, so through teaching him some uh, processes, you were able to turn that situation around. Again, a win-win situation. Now, 20% of the time, the employee will continue to do what they're doing, which will lead to a formal warning, and ultimately they'll resign uh, again, that's a win-win situation. So Kate, I think you, you've recently had that experience yourself. Around 5% of the time, you may need to terminate due to the employee resisting the counselling or coaching, uh, or you're coaching them to improve their performance. So I can, you know, I have literally been responsible for thousands of employees throughout my career. I can say that on less than one hand is the amount of times I've actually had to terminate by following the counselling procedure. It's important to recognise that there is a bad, if there is a bad orange in the team, it is important to remove the bad orange fast before the rot sets in with the other team members. So um, it's something that you do need to be aware of. Uh, again, demonstrate it. Uh, the number of times I've had people come up and thank me when I have addressed um, poor attitude or bad behaviour in the workplace. It's also important to understand that some of your team members may not want to ride on the journey with creating a winning team or a championship team, and they may need to get off the bus. So the fourth key to a winning team is having an action plan. The action uh, plan can take many forms. It could be a production plan. It may be a marketing plan, a sales or a service plan. Having an operations plan, a financial plan, or any other plan that identifies what needs to be achieved daily, weekly, monthly, or quarterly. The aim of the plan is to identify what needs to be done, who needs to do what, and by when. So good action plans are more than just what needs to be done and by when. In addition to operational milestones and key performance indicators, they contain positional contracts, systems manuals, plans of action, and much, much more. My challenge for you as part of your actions to take away from today is to take some time to review your own action plans that take place in your business every day, and then look for ways that you can improve how your action plan can be modified to improve the results and outcomes that you're achieving. Using the football analogy from earlier, the coach and his, his key staff are always looking at the game. They're reviewing and refining the action plan during the game that will achieve a winning result for the team. Apply the same principles in your own business. The fifth key to a winning team is to support risk taking you must be open to support a level of risk taking by your team in order to improve the results that you're aiming to achieve. Think about how we live today. Is it 
any different to the way that people lived two or three hundred years ago? How is this possible? Yeah. Last year I was in Edin Edinburgh and took a, a tour that went under the current city of Edinburgh. Um, and it, it was back three, two, two or three hundred years ago and they described the way that people live then. I'm glad that I live in today's environment. So how is it possible? It is possible because someone somewhere had a vision for what could be possible and encouraged their team members to take a risk on changing how they did things in their work environment that had a positive impact on the end result. It is also quite possible that there are, were many failures along the way. So every business has experienced product, employee or service failure. It comes with the territory. One of the best ways to feed your company culture and to grow is to openly address your failures and be open to discussion and feedback from the, from the team. Failure can lead to more failure unless you are willing to learn to look at each failure and use it to your advantage to help propel your business forward. Understand that in order to achieve a breakthrough um, or change, it follows a breakdown, a break apart, a break with, or a break up. In supporting risk taking, you must also have some strong caveats around the rules of the game of risk taking. The first caveat must be, when you identify that a mistake has been made, report it immediately. That way the team can then identify how to minimize and mitigate the impact that the mistake or failure has had on the products or services that you offer. So encourage your team members. If they make a mistake, come and tell you about it or someone straight away. The second caveat is to communicate that the only time you will have a formal discussion with a team member regarding a mistake is if they don't report the mistake and you find out about it later or they make the same mistake twice. Think about, you know, if you've had kids or, or do have kids, it's, um, that's one of the first rules of parenthood. Um, tell me about it straight away because if I find out later, you're in trouble. Um, so again, apply the same principle in business. Remember, Thomas Edison and his team found more than a thousand ways that the light bulb didn't work before they found the right solution. And hence we now have the light bulb today. So failure is not a bad thing. It's important that in the game of business, that you do not rest on your laurels. If you are not constantly looking for improvements, your competition will eventually take, uh, overtake you and leave you behind. Companies that have gone from good to great will have adopted the Japanese principle of Kaizen. In today's language, that's continuous improvement. Be comfortable that change is good and supporting risk taking can propel your company forward through a uniqueness that sets you apart from your competition. The sixth key to a winning team is 100% inclusion and involvement from the team. Team members who are engaged put energy and excitement into the work that they create. If you want to build a strong company culture and maintain or hire a team who is loyal to their work, loyal to you, you must engage them, all of them. So culture is a collective concept and is produced by groups of people. What your company creates together and how it performs together is at the heart of that culture and not merely in the hands of the leaders. The most successful companies understand the importance of input from all their employees and it is through all the steps we have mentioned 
uh, that you engage with transparency, nurturing, motivation, communication, and celebrating milestones. If your employees don't understand the what and the why they come to work every day through the business vision, the common goals, rules of the game, and their role in the action plan, then they will be very limited in how they can contribute to the overall success of winning the game of business. I recently conducted um, a rules of the game culture setting uh, workshop with one of my clients and they brought their whole team in. The interesting thing was it was the team that came up with their own rules of the game rather than the business owners. And uh, it's been amazing to watch the team on that journey and how they, they actually, because they set the rules of the game, they're actually following them religiously. The seventh key to a winning team is knowing and understanding your people. It is important to understand the very fine line of being friends and being friendly. I've witnessed too many examples where business owners or business leaders have not applied some genuine attention to getting to know their team or appreciate them for how they contribute to the success of the business. Knowing and appreciating your team is a key attribute of strong leadership. When you engage with your team members and show them that you value them, then the majority are going to want to be a part of your company's journey and future. As a strong leader in your business, thinking of the future is taking a big picture look at the company. You also want to look at more than numbers and performance as an employee's role in your success or failure is one of the most important things to consider when trying to predict what the future holds. Make sure that your employees are part of that growth. If there are roles to fill or projects that you need a leader, look within your organization first to find employees with skills and ambition to fill roles. Play to their strengths and nurture your team on the individual level. Notice the work they are doing, use them as a positive example and show them when that, that show them that they're valued. After all, a high performance culture is sustained by employees that feel valued, noticed and nurtured. A quote from Richard Branson really reflects this point. Clients do not come first, employees must come first. If you care about your employees, they will take care of the clients. Remember the cycle of business uh, slide. In getting to know and understand your people, it is also important to understand the differences between the different generations in the workplace. I was at a conference in Vancouver a few, few years ago and the subject of millennials in the workplace was raised as being a major concern worldwide and in particular how business would need to adapt to this new generation of team members. The statistics are indicating that millennials will make up more than 60% of the workforce by 2025. You'll hear many different opinions on the millennial generation. There's the view that as employees, they can be a little difficult to handle. What is interesting is that there's plenty of research that shows that they're motivated differently than the Gen X and baby boomers that came before them. I guess that uh, relates to most of us on this um, webinar. Here are a few examples that we need to understand about them. They're not as focused on money and title. They're more interested in a sense of pride and achievement in their work. The second point is millennials are willing to move jobs more rapidly. There is the loyalty light approach. If the role isn't giving them what they feel they need, they simply move on. 
Millennials are far more likely to want to work for brands and businesses that align with their own values. Hence the rise in recent times we've seen where business actively promotes their corporate social responsibility programs. It's all in the name of gaining the attention of millennials. They want flexibility. It's often said that millennials are the first generation to truly adopt a work-life balance. They do shun the nine to five workday and are happy to work remotely or even at odd hours. Most of all, they're digital natives who grew up with technology and see it as being the norm. This is a current topic that businesses must be on top of if they are going to attract and retain key members in their winning team. It is important that you do your own research on adapting millennials in the workplace. Um, so please write this down as a Google search. Uh, and that, that Google search is Millennials in the Workforce Australia. There are some great articles pop up here to help you gain a better understanding of the emerging millennial workforce. So when you develop a winning team, you create synergy in your business. Synergy by definition is a state in which two or more things work together in a particularly fruitful way that produces an effective or an effect greater than the sum of the individual efforts. Expressed also as uh, uh, the whole is greater th than the sum of its parts. So one plus one can equal three, four, five, six or more. Synergy is created when you have a team who are committed to achieving the business vision through strong leadership, working to a common goal, having rules of the game in place, working to a clear action plan, being supported with risk taking uh, in improving their work, having 100% involvement and inclusion in contributing to the end result of their responsibilities, knowing, supporting and appreciating each other. These are the seven keys to a winning team. I often reflect on how I could have made a far greater impact with my management and leadership contribution to the businesses that I have worked for in the past. If I had only had these seven keys to a winning team principles to work with earlier on in my career. So I'd like to take another poll. Um, and this time it, the poll is um, future of uh, DISC assessments. So given what you've learned today about DISC and teams, would you be likely to utilize DISC assessments in the future? So if you could just uh, type in your, uh, in the poll right now. So remember the, you know, DISC is about team training, aligning towards a common goal, recruiting and hiring uh, uh, the right people, leadership and development, improvement relationships with, uh, or improving relationships with customers. So, um, all right, so we're in the polling, we'll share the results. So everybody is in agreement that DISC profiling can help you understand your team better. And, uh, you know, that is a, a, one of the key steps to creating a championship team. Thank you for that. Now, quoting Brad Sugars. Um, Words can inspire, thoughts can provoke, but only action truly brings you closer to your dreams. So take a few minutes to reflect on what you've learned today and what you are really going to act on once you return back to your uh, work environment. So please type in the, in the chat box, what has inspired you most today? So just don't take a few minutes to do that.
Okay, so uh, responses are starting to come in. Um, all right, so the relevance of DISC, uh, the need to get a, uh, to know the team better and express appreciation. It's important there to always be celebrating or find a way to celebrate even the small wins with your team. Um, DISC can be used when choosing your next employee. DISC and counselling for improvement. Okay, well done team. All right. Um, so uh, the offer today is if you are serious about implementing the seven keys to a winning team and building a better culture in your business, then getting to know and understand firstly yourself, your team members, and then ultimately your customers is a great starting point. As a reward for investing your time and interest in learning how to develop your teams today, I'm offering you access to the DISC and Motivators assessments for $119, which is normally priced at $199. And this does include a one-to-one -one debriefing for you and uh, any of your team's assessment reports. So I'll leave this offer, offer open until uh, the 22nd of June. And you must email me now or call me to uh, take advantage of that offer. Okay, so uh, for business owners, I'm also offering a, a complimentary 90 minute business strategy review meeting. We will review where you're currently at in your business and then identify a number of specific strategies that will enable you to move your business from where you are uh, now to where you would like to be. So again, please email me with your interest in taking up the business strategy review offer. I'll come back to you with some alternate dates um, where, that we may be able to align our calendars with. So please reach out if you have any questions at all. Thank you for, <coughs> excuse me, thank you for investing your time today in learning about the seven keys to a winning team. I trust that I've achieved my goal today of pushing you outside your comfort zone and inspired you to identify the actions that you will take in enrolling and engaging your team to become a championship team in your organization. Like all good businesses, I do appreciate your five-star reviews on what you have learned today. If you have any further questions, please email me at philbajura at actioncoach.com. I'm here to help. So it's now time to get into action. I look forward to chatting with you soon. Bye now.